Roger and Brianna let their passion for one another rage like a bonfire, and Claire and Jamie make a beeline for the tree line. <laughs> Let's go. Outlander Season 4, Episode 3, The False Bride. Hey guys, it's Marsha, and welcome to Really Seriously For Real. The last two episodes left a dark cloud wandering over Claire and Jamie. So me, as the viewer, was looking for much needed levity. Knowing this episode would be our first look at Brianna and Roger, who we last saw getting closely associated with each other's lips after Claire's departure in season three, I thought we would be in for some cute, romantic, puppy love kind of specialness. And we were, up until things got weird just past the halfway point, but let me back up. Jamie said his goodbyes to Aunt Jocasta, informing her that he and Claire will continue on West. Of course, Jocasta was more than disappointed and scoffed at the idea of Jamie pursuing the printing trade. In fact, that was the first time she truly let out a supreme air of annoyance. I'm, I'm telling you, I really enjoyed Aunt Jocasta, or I should say, more so Maria Doyle Kennedy, who portrays her. She's given Jocasta so many layers. Kindness, softness, stoic, and stern. Honestly, really well done. When Jamie refused an offering of money, she would hear nothing of it and walked away. Now, I was cracking up because Jamie looked at the money, and then back at Jocasta, and then took the money and followed her. Like... Okay, uh, if you insist, Auntie. Because I was about to say, come on, Jamie, now you know that you need that money where you're going. Jocasta offered Jamie candlesticks that belonged to Jamie's mom, Ellen, and told him tenderly how she would wish that she could just see his face once more. Oh my God, that just gave me all the feels. I think many of us were hoping for a bit more conversation about Jamie's mom, but I think this moment, no matter how small, it was just the right touch. And then it was Claire's turn. In Outlander, Claire and Jamie are the heroes. So I'm usually supposed to side with the heroes. No matter how out there they may be in any situation. But look, y'all already know, I don't hold back if something puts me off. So when Claire says her goodbyes to Jocasta, it was in the doorway of the room that Jocasta was in. Okay guys, it was complete opposite ends of each other. And it was kind of like, thanks, bye. I mean, okay, Claire, she tried. There was a little bit more to the conversation. And I understand that the awful events just happened the night before, so it's fresh in everyone's mind. Look, I, I'm a Scorpio, and Scorpios hold grudges. I never forget. But it just seemed like Claire was holding Jocasta responsible for everything. Yes. She's a woman of her time, but hardly responsible for a collective ignorance. Meeting Aunt Jocasta is like meeting Jamie's mom by extension. You came to her door with nothing and she offered you everything with nothing asked of you in return. Okay, well, other than the acceptance of these cultural differences, we'll say. Aunt Jocasta, I mean, she started out by apologizing for the occurrences of the previous evening. I don't know, I just, I guess I would have handled it differently, so that kind of put me off a bit. In fact, this whole episode would have been perfect for a reaction video, because I'm telling you guys, you should have saw the faces I was making. Anyway, the more interesting thing is that Jocasta snapped at Claire and told her that Jamie is blinded for his love for you. You're preventing him from achieving greatness. Ouch, there's that fire. She came down a little hard on Claire, and I would say after that, it would have been more appropriate that Claire said her abrupt goodbyes, because that type of exchange would make sense, and I would totally understand. I mean, either way, everyone's tensions were high. Though, interestingly, Claire tells Jocasta, how dare she judge? She hasn't even seen Jamie since he was a boy and has known the two of them together for only a few days. But couldn't the same have been said by how Claire handled things when they first got to River Run? Listen, tell me if I'm wrong. I will totally understand. And I know 
And I understand that the book will offer a more robust and rounded description of events, but the show has to present this to readers and non-readers alike. So I don't know, like after watching all three episodes several times over, I think this is where the show gets a bit clunky. Yeah, I'll say clunky. It's not, I wanna throw my TV out the window. It's more like they needed to iron out the execution a bit better. So westward they go, including Ian, after he gave Jamie an impassioned and mature reason why he should stay. John Quincy Myers also showed up, courtesy of Aunt Jocasta. I mean, you know, it's funny because like I kind of looked at that scene Aunt Jocasta, again, she's like the mother figure. And I just think about my own mom. Anytime, you know, we would visit, whatever the case was, she's always stocking her bags with all kinds of stuff. Oh, here's some food. Here's some blankets. Here's some clothes. You need some slippers? You know, like, <laughs> you know, she always wants to make sure that we have everything that we need. And so that was Aunt Jocasta, you know, just making sure her surrogate baby <laughs> is set on his long journey. So anyway, John Quincy Myers, like I said, is going to lead them a ways until they have to part ways the next morning. And with Ian, <laughs> the look on Jamie and Claire's face when he said that Ian was going with him. They were like, I'm sorry, you said what? <laughs> but ultimately, they decide to trust their nephew's life with the man they just met. <laughs> now, y'all already know what I'm thinking moving on on the other side of time roger is sadly handing over the keys to his empty home to mrs graham's granddaughter fiona and her husband um this scene actually opens the show another slight annoyance only slight is that the show didn't really explain why fiona was getting the house i mean roger was looking so glib it was like okay would well, you fall on hard times and you know have to sell the place anyway he says he's headed to america for a Scottish ceremony and to see his kind of sort of girlfriend Brianna Fiona tells him go get your girl although I think she may have needed to be a little bit more specific with what she was thinking because later on things just get awkward <laughs> we'll get to that Roger flies to America and he and Brianna drive to North Carolina for a Scottish festival on the way they play an intellectual game involving cats and Miss Flirty Brianna grabs a kiss nearly causing poor Roger to run off the road. Kids, don't try this anywhere. Okay, and this was probably the coolest scene in the whole show. The same road that they were on transitioned from 1970 to Claire, Jamie, Ian, and John traveling by horseback on the very same stretch of land. Very cool. Okay, my transitions are a bit clunky because I already said that John and Ian left, but I'm not feeling well, so I'm just going to blame it on that. All right, but I want to stick with Bree and Roger because they were cute for a bit. <laughs> they went to the Scottish Festival and Roger sang and played the guitar and that was really Richard Rankin singing. Boy can sing. Very good. And Brianna, she got all googly eyed. <laughs> Note his song was called The False Bride. When Roger walks her to the cabin, she invites him inside after presenting him with the gift of liquor and literature. Once inside, she wasted no time unleashing the animal inside and Roger wasted no time unraveling the mood by asking Brianna to marry him. This is where the show got a little weird for me. Roger was so, I, can't even think of the proper word abrasive maybe it was just so uncomfortable not the sweet Roger I'd come to love I thought Brianna handled herself pretty well I mean she's like 23 it's the 70s she's like this is going a bit too fast slow down honey we have all the time in the world he says he's old-fashioned and yeah he grew up in a reverend's home but I just found him to be plain brutish if I can't have all of you, I don't want any of you. Ill. And the next day at the bonfire, even Brianna, she tried to bridge the divide. He still acted so angry. So I'm glad Brianna left because he doesn't deserve you. All right, let's get back to the past. So Claire and Jamie are traveling. And now you know, Jocasta is in Claire's head and got her all shook up. So 
Claire asked Jamie if he was sure if this was the life that he wanted, which I mean, of course it is. <laughs> He's happy, she's happy, I was happy, cause I felt like I was getting some good conversation until Claire goes chasing after a donkey that bolted after it was spooked by thunder. Claire, 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 oh Lord. I thought we already established that you and Jamie can't be separated. Crazy things happen when you separate. And then boom, she's lost, lightning bolt hits a tree, she's knocked off a horse and knocked out. The horse is out of there saying, we should have stayed with Jamie. She wakes up and it's pouring rain and now she has to cozy up under a tree for shelter. She takes off her shoes and gets comfortable, then looks over <laughs> and what do we have here? Finds a skull and then calmly unearths it and I don't know, some sort of jewel or stone. Then, then a figure holding a torch starts walking or phasing towards her. He's basically a ghost. He just stares at her and she walks up to him and calmly asks, who are you? What do you want? I wish y'all could see my face right now. You're lost at night in the woods, thunder, lightning, torrential rain. You sit in a tree for shelter and y'all know how I feel about certain types of trees. You find a skull and then said owner of skull takes a leisurely stroll in ghost form and just stares at you and you're calm. Nope, uh-uh. The ghost turns around and disappears, but not before you see the fresh scalping he receives, I guess. It was the same as the skull. Anyway, next day, Claire finds that her shoes were gone, but she follows the footsteps that were in the mud that lead her to Jamie, who had been looking for her, but stopped once he found the shoes just hanging out by the stream. Claire tells him about the spirit, but he was just so thankful for her return. Guess he was like, good thing you showed up, otherwise I'd have to go back to River Run like, Auntie, I guess I'll take you up on that offer now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Later on, Claire realizes the skull had silver fillings and figures he too must have been a traveler. The plot thickens. In the end, Claire and Jamie take a break from riding and happen upon some strawberries, which Jamie explains that's the emblem of his house, Frasier, and then looks out at that big, beautiful CGI scenery and says, let's settle here and call it Frasier's Ridge. Okay, let's just get right to my final thoughts. I think overall, the episode was a nice way to cradle us from the two previous heavy ones. But while I was fine with everything up to just past the midpoint, the rest was a bit clunky. I, I gotta tell you, I was extremely turned off by Roger in the end. And that's unfortunate because I always liked him. The reveal of Frasier's Ridge was better for me on the second watch. Cause the first time through, I was just so put off by the Roger scenes and the weird fascination with the skeleton that I kind of checked out, I guess. All right, question of the day. What do you think of Roger's behavior with Brianna? Go ahead, comment down below. Excellent. All right, tell me if you like this video by giving it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Click that bell so you're always notified when I upload a video. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time.